evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, latest event in the 2019 uh, lecture series of the museum. From invitation to deportation uh, is this year's excellent theme. In 2016, when Barbados was at a particularly low point, economic malaise had created a social malaise had created a deep cynicism amongst the population. You would hear people say, all politicians are the same, all politics is corrupt. There was an absence of hope. And um, the current prime minister was uh, then leader of the opposition, and she was trying to think of a way in which she could talk to people about hope. And she wanted to have a document that would explain a philosophy of what we're trying to do as a country and where we're trying to go, and how policies follow from trying to make a better place, trying to make the best of Barbados, and shouldn't be seen purely in the framework of corrupt politicians or people trying to get a, uh, concerned about their own particular interest, seen in terms of a bigger picture, a bigger journey, a bigger story. And in thinking about how she would open that document, which was later called the Covenant of Hope, she argued that we should begin with a chapter on national consciousness. And initially, I, I was not uh, convinced. I thought that national consciousness is a very important thing, but it's not an easily tangible thing. Will people really understand what we're talking about? Well, people think the whole thing is quite airy-fairy. Talking about philosophy, talking about national consciousness, well, they think it's not real. But of course, national consciousness is critical. If we are transforming a society, then that will relate to our national consciousness, our sense of self, what it is today, and what it will move to and develop in the future. And a key part of national consciousness, national identity, sense of self, culture, history, and these all these things tie up with the theme of today's lecture. We talk about the Windrush generation coming home to mother, the motherland, and documenting the migrant experience that Mr. Claude Graham is going to talk to us about. It reminded me that my own father was part of that generation. We tend to think of Windrush, it's a, well, one particular boat, there were many boats. It was one boat that uh, plied the seas in the late 40s and early 50s, but many migrants from the Caribbean went to uh, Britain throughout the 50s and the 60s, in different ways, in the 60s, some of them went by plane, some of them went by banana boat. When he first arrived in Britain, like the Windrush generation, he was a bus conductor in the London underground, uh, London transport. And those were the days before the Clean Air Act, where you had pea soup, pea soup fog. He, one of his jobs would be to stand in front of the bus with a, lant, a lantern so people could see where they're going. Later, he became a signalman on the London underground, a job that no longer exists today. And whilst he, like many people from the Caribbean, suffered daily, tremendous amount of racism, of challenges, living in very difficult conditions, and we're going to learn more about the migrant experience in a moment. There was also diamonds in that rough, and when we look back at that history as a family, he often tells us, despite all of that pain and challenge, that there was someone, there was a local union shop steward, who insisted that with the school grades he'd had back in Georgetown, that he could apply for university. And my dad didn't want to do that. He was having a good time. He was a chain smoker back in those days, uh, and he was a young man going to dancing and enjoying himself and with his friends. And this shop steward kept on pulling and pushing away, and so about three or four years later, he ended up at university uh, Queen's University of Belfast, and a changed life and career. So in all those challenging times, there is also humanity uh, in that migrant experience. It was difficult. It forged a community, forged 
a, a nation, made us strong, made us proud of our parents. Uh, but there was a variety of experiences, some bad, some challenging, some good, some hopeful, some love, as, as well as all those difficulties. This week, we're celebrating another great Caribbean journalist, the sad passing of Harold Hoyt, uh, a man who epitomized the traditions of great journalism in the Caribbean and the beginnings of that journalism at CBC and elsewhere in the nation and journalism uh, as a writer, a great writer. One always came across the man's class in all of his writing. And today's uh, lecture will be delivered by another great Caribbean journalist, Claude Graham, many years at the CBC, now since retired, uh, and uh, has experienced the whole evolution of journalism here in Barbados uh, and the nature of media here in Barbados. And so we're in for a treat this morning, this evening. Please welcome uh, Claude Graham. Professor Persaud, permit me to thank you very much for that introduction. And the challenge now is for me to live up to your expectations. I want to thank the museum and the university and all the related sponsors for exercising confidence in my ability to speak eloquently and thoroughly with respect to the subject. Let me begin at a small village in St. John in the parish of Barbados. And that village is closely hugged by three plantations, Moncrief, Mount Pleasant, and Society. There's a fourth plantation uh, to the west, Guinea. But that plantation uh, insists on keeping its distance. Stuart Hill has what could be described as a spine road that runs from east to west. And between 1955 and 1966, there were 23 residents, residences on that stretch. And from these, 43 would make the journey to England to become part of what would later be known as the Windrush generation, husbands, wives, aunts, people who were related, masons, carpenters, drivers, semi-skilled, they represented a very small portion of what was happening across Barbados and the rest of the Caribbean. They were making the long trek to Britain in response to Mother's Call. They were going not as natural of spring. They were going as immigrants. And time alone would tell what awaited them. Like you, I would want to understand the response of those immigrants. Some context is necessary. In the case of Barbados, official records go a long way to help us understand what that context was. Like the mother country, Barbados is an island minuscule, but we have no navy, no air force, no army, nor have we ever attempted to engage in expansionist tendencies. Yet, from the floors of the Barbados Parliament, this 166 square mile territory was being referred to as Little England. And when the British Prime Minister, the wartime Prime Minister, retired, in Parliament itself, he was being referred to as the greatest Englishman of them all. A sense of misplaced reverence for the mother country, if I may say so, and its leadership. This was a time when almost every school child could tell you who Lord Nelson was, the last battle that he fought, and his famous last words. They could make a connection between Wellington, Waterloo, and Napoleon. But for the most part, none of them could make sense of 
Who was Bassa? What's the Haitian Revolution all about? Harriet Tubman. They knew nothing about those things. Who was Shaka Zulu? These would have been novelties to most of us in those days. So coming home to mother would not only have been viewed as a means to improve one's social and economic circumstances, it would have been readily accepted as the honorable thing to do. And the term mother would have given rise to a certain expectation in terms of civility. And when we talk about the immigrant experience, that would project the actual reality. So what we're going to try to do in this presentation is to see the extent to which expectation and reality either converged or diverge. So let's continue by identifying the Windrush generation. We turn to Emeritus Professor of Sociology at London South Bank University, Harry Gilborn. He made the trip to England in 1959, along with his father and six others, for what was intended to be a short time. But that time has not yet ended. Professor Gilborn asserts that not only those 492 disembarking from the Windrush in 1948 make up that generation, but all others who followed from the colonies of the Commonwealth. He cites the partition of India in 1947 along with the rise of African nationalism. This saw millions establishing communities in the UK, rendering that country the multicultural society that it is today. And the West Indies with its already solid history of integration South Asians, Arabs, Africans, and Europeans contributed in no less measure to this multiculturalism. Professor Gilborn sets the Windrush era as that period between 1948 and the 1960s when the 1962 Commonwealth Immigration Act became effective, restricting and monitoring integration into Britain. What about the experiences and the reaction. Those daring to go home to mother would encounter cruel forms of rejection. But their response to vicious racial discrimination kept the focus on the principle of the equality of all persons and this without prejudice to the rights of any other individual. Discrimination was prevalent in employment, housing, justice, and education. There was exclusion from working men's clubs, pubs, and even from the churches, leading to the formation of non-discriminating meeting points by the Windrush guests. The outcome, the reaction, the Caribbean artist movement funded by Kamau Bathwit, Andrew Salki, and John LaRose. An inclusive cultural movement that boasted white British associates. No less an example was the indoor carnival started by Claudia Jones of Trinidad and Tobago in 1959, and this was in response to the racist violence and riots that swept through Britain in 1958. With all this going on, there was some form of assessment, and then the findings were published. Seven years into the Windrush event, a report on West Indian immigration to the UK was published in the Barbados Official Gazette of June 16, 1955. There were a number of findings. We're looking at the assessment and the findings. Seven years into the Windrush event, a report on West Indian immigrants to the UK published in the Barbados Official Gazette, June 15, 1955. The findings included the fact that employment opportunities existed for both males and females. Accommodation was difficult to access. Housing was a problem for both immigrants and locals alike. For example, rates were high and covered bed, linen, and light. And if it was the cold of winter and you required heating, 
this would involve additional costs. The search for better accommodation and work resulted in drift. People were moving away from the areas in which they felt comfortable to settle. Large, number, large numbers of immigrant arrivals aggravated the housing problems. Worker opposition intensified. The demand for labor remained unsatisfied. The main opposition to West Indian workers came from their trade unions rank and file. Because pay was below expectations, West Indians were constantly on the lookout for better opportunities, resulting in the drift alluded to earlier. West Indians were badly prepared for the climate and for economic conditions, and the press made a mockery of this. They were lampooned. Men arriving in winter were shown in their shirt sleeves and inappropriate footwear. The report said many people were interested in helping to break down prejudices so as to make integration into British society easier. This was an ambitious expectation. And we saw that the seeds for this content had already been sown. In fact, those seeds were germinating. Have you ever had cold water thrown in your face? If the British understood hospitality, and they certainly did, so too did West Indians. The traditional afternoon tea set the standard that should exist between host and guests, warmly inviting open doors. Wind rush occurred at a time when West Indians not only practiced hospitality, they lived it. And I, for one, can remember the days when we were totally without communication systems and people would turn up without invitation to the houses, to their homes, and they were warmly welcomed, yeah? And there was a common saying, if you turned up at dinner or lunch or even breakfast, I didn't put you in, but I'm certainly going to take you out. So to many seeking accommodation, I'm referring to the Windrush guests, their eyes would be met with signs which said, no Irish, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs, no blacks. And here, the English, the host, was equating the visitors, their guests, with uh, an enemy that they love to hate and one of their cherished domestic animals. And with respect to the window signs, they were quite offensive as well. They simply said, no colors. But West Indians, we are known for our resilience. 400 years or so of forced enslavement did not result in the extermination of the black man. And an insensitive sign could not be expected to dampen the, the determination of all the Rush brothers. 1955 saw the British Parliament passing the first anti-immigration law, but as time would eventually prove, fundamental changes in human behavior cannot be legislated. There's a case of the undocumented homecomers. Another important consideration in the Winrush experience is that many, in many instances, children making the journey with their parents traveled on the latter's passport and never applied for travel documents. Such oversight would eventually lead to dire consequences for those affected. The state broadcasts estimate the number of those so affected to be in the region of thousands. But whatever their circumstances were, the Windrush guests produced significantly without hostile, in spite of hostile restraints. In an article published on October 4, 2018, Professor Linda McDowell from Oxford University noted that despite rampant discrimination in the workplace, for decades, the early workers made a huge contribution to the growth of the British economy. 
She told of how West Indians previously working in skilled positions and possessing excellent employment credentials found themselves restricted to jobs the locals considered undesirable. Her article, How Caribbean Migrants Helped to Rebuild Britain, cited examples of the extreme prejudices in the workplace. For example, one who undertook training to be a nurse reported how West Indian students were told to clean lockers and the beds, were made to clean the wheelchairs and the commodes. There was another example where the worker said, initially, patients were not used to black people and they were very nasty. They would throw their things at you and call you black, but you would look beyond that. The skills of the males also did not go with, the skills of the males also went without recognition. There was a case of one Clinton Edwards who served in the Royal Air Force during the war and returned to England on the Windrush. He found a job as a welder. However, he did no welding. He was given a shovel and a wheelbarrow and told to clean up. Edwards disliked his work so much that he re-enlisted in the RAF for another eight years and afterwards joined a firm, British Oxygen, as a lab technician. And there he was able to do what he was trained to do. He was able to weld. There was another variable in the equation. Far-right activities from within the Conservative Party added anxiety and disquieting pain to the Windrush experience. For example, Enoch Powell's inflammatory comments painted the new Caribbean immigrants as lacking in experience and culture. He campaigned black against the black immigrants as a threat to what constituted Britishness. Powell agitated for a reduction of the black population and for assistance to families opting to return to their country of origin. He further claimed that 150,000 British citizens were leaving every year impelled by the prospect of the future consequences of colored immigration. Ultimately, mother's true colors would emerge. Fast forward to 2017 and Theresa May's hostile environment policy requiring employers, banks, landlords, and the National Health Service to conduct visa inspections. The result, well over 5,000 legal UK residents rendered homeless, ineligible for health care, or marked for deportation as illegals. Jamaica continues to bear the brunt of this hostile policy. The foundation was laid for the Rainwash activity and we're going to see the extent to which the policymakers in the Caribbean took note of what was likely to happen. From the outset, the government and peoples of the West Indies recognize elements of risk attached to, re to, to returning or venturing into mother's backyard. The Caribbean service of the BBC put out a series of broadcasts suggesting that those looking for employment may take certain specific actions. This was done in conjunction with the London office of the Commissioner of the West Indies, British Guyana, and British Honduras. The talks were reproduced in pamphlet with a foreword from the then head of the West Indies Federation, Sir Grant Lee Adams, who viewed the event as a venturesome step that was not to be undertaken lightly. There was great concern for the welfare of those setting out. We're now going to hear of an example which set the tone for what was to follow. The E.R. Braithwit experience. E.R. Berthwick began studies at Cambridge just before the start of the Second World War. At the breakout of the war, at the breakout of hostilities, he 
enlisted in the RAF Royal Air Force and did duties as a fighter pilot. At the end of the war, he returned to Cambridge where he became eminently qualified in physics. Searching for employment in a related field proved futile, a foretaste of what the Windrush visitors would experience. Bradford reported being denied employment with elaborate casualness and courtesy, with reasons having nothing to do with his abilities or qualifications. This was the environment into which the Rush generation was venturing. Brotherich said that with the war over, Britain had abandoned its pretense of hand-in-hand -hand brotherliness and reverted to demonstrating the very same action it had wrongly condemned in the, in, the, in the Germans, the action of racist attitudes. To earn his bread, Brathwaite secured a job as a teacher of those whom certain members of the British Parliament referred to as the great unwashed. And there within the school system, he encountered bigotry and intolerance from both students and members of the faculty. But he was shrewd enough to learn from the students themselves exactly how he could teach them. That fact was eloquently captured in his book, To Serve With Love, which eventually became a movie. Bathurst's comments were taken from his foreword to the publication, Empire Win Rush, 50 Years of Writing About Black Britain, marking the 50th anniversary of Win Rush, and that occurred in 1998. At that time, he concluded that the first step was still to be taken in Britain towards racial harmony. The children of the Windrush. Whether the parents took their children on the journey, left them to follow later, or the children were born in the UK, human developmental factors would impact the issue of identity development for such children. That is, whether they were English or whether they were West Indian. According to Edwin de Lobo, such questions arose following some stressful experience in the streets, name calling or viewing National Front demonstrations on television. De Lobo perceived a bigger problem for those who joined the parents at a later time having absorbed the culture of their native environment and being expected to change to the host identity. Then there were the children of mixed parents. If they adopted the identity of one parent or the other, societal rejection was the most likely outcome, with their being labeled colored. De Lobo painted an even graver outcome for the child of mixed parents when that child was taken into care. Having no one to identify with, he felt deserted, unwanted, and as a misfit, belong, not belonging to any group. So, I have spoken enough. So, I'm going to allow the second generation and others to speak out. This is where we give you a video presentation uh, where we had recorded the responses of many of that generation. Just before the turn of the century, descendants of the immigrants spoke out for themselves. Beyond their own families and Caribbean colleagues, they saw themselves surrounded by a harsh and uncaring people. When I first came here, things were very, very difficult. And settling, and what, you know, when I first came to England, that was back in the 50s. I'd been into a hospital at the time, and it was very, very, you know, it was only few of you like came to the, to this place, and you never had any friends or what have you not. So you had to leave and go to to find get friends. That's how I met my husband back in the 50s when I was started to do my training and from then he was ever so good really. I gave that up actually eventually to be with him and I had four daughters 
which brought them up in the right way. We had our problems and what have you now, but things have changed over the years. We've seen the difference now. There was a lot of rough, rough times in the 50s. For us, it was very hard, but we still, I mean, I always that sort. I just carry on, keep away from people's way and just do the best I can. And I find I get on all right. I never had any problem here, really, to criticize all it is. I always had a job, but the money wasn't very good because when I start working, all I used to get was five from a week to bring up the children, which was very hard. Some were able to rationalize all of this as connected to the black man's way of life more and more information is becoming available um, to us as a people. Um, we have to recognize that um, our ancestors were stolen, kidnapped, taken from the continent of Africa and brought to the Caribbean. And through that process, we lost a lot of our abilities to speak in our own mother tongues. We lost some of our religious connections. Um, we have become sort of Europeanized in terms of how we um, define ourselves and the sort of values that we have. Um, and I think, and certainly for myself in recent years, I've been investigating uh, uh, my ancestry, uh, my African culture, um, and I see that as an important um, development as a young African man. To be the only black person in a class or an entire school led to ridicule, exclusion, and in some cases, a prolonged state of trauma. Such was the experience of a second generation Barbadian resident in Bristol. She was left longing for the country and home that up until that time, she had never seen. When I was growing up, um we were the first, one of the only black families in the area, and all my friends were white, um, apart from one or two. And I didn't really feel as if I fitted in with their world. Um, but at the same time, I didn't know much about where my parents came from. Now, I've never been to Barbados. Um, I've heard a lot about it from my family and friends of the family, and I'd like to visit, but I don't, it doesn't, feels to me like home. I mean, when my parents speak of home, I can't imagine myself. I've never described it as home. I mean, how can it be home? I've never been there. I don't feel as if my connections are that strong to Barbados. But at the same time, I don't feel as if I belong here. I don't describe myself as English. I reluctantly call myself British. But I, I don't feel as if I belong. And I don't feel as if I'm wanted here. Um, I feel like I'm caught between two cultures. and. I'm trying to find where I belong. Um, I think I always need to make a, like a, pil a pilgrimage to Barbados to find, find out where I belong. And in a way, I'm scared to do that in case it's not home. Um, where will I belong? What, how will I describe myself? You know, what's my identity? I'm, I'm a black woman, but am I British? Or am I West Indian, Barbadian? I, I don't know, I just feel very confused. Things have been a lot more easier. It's hard when I was younger, growing up in a lighter, being in a white community, and me and my brother being the only black people in the school, not many of us there. But as times got on and I've got older, um, and times have changed, I think I've got a little bit more respect from other people. Um, and colour doesn't seem to come into the issue any longer. Whereas when I was younger, that was the first thing people ever saw was a colour before they saw anything else. So what sort of difference has this made to you as an individual um, and to what you're able to achieve? I feel more comfortable now than what I was when I was younger. I always felt like getting on the bus or going into a shop, people would stand. Like I, I felt that like people were standing even though they probably weren't. That's the way I just felt. Um, and I think it's made as I got older and I have a child myself now, it's, it's made it easier on him, especially now that he's get, growing older. There's more lack of people around in all areas now, whereas before it was only in certain areas, so it makes it easier. Looking back at the struggle, 
gave rise to a blend of pain and subsequent accomplishment. Ex-RAF veteran Sam King recalled the harsh experience involved in trying to find accommodation. There's another side to it. Let us look at Coventry. The Germans had bom bombed Coventry Pool made up a one mile square. The people were living in huts in the woods. So it's no use you going to Coventry say so you were looking for accommodation. You could sleep in the park a few nights until winter, then you'd have to move. At the same time, there were few English people. I was blessed that the sea graves in Nottingham, 15 Montague, Sp 15 Montague Street, Bullwell, Nottingham, their son and I were in the Air Force together, and they invited me home. And until, until today, I'm a part of the family. But my people in general, it was treated very bad. And there's a certain irony in the degree to which some experiences varied. The agreement. <laughs> I would hope that what would really emerge would be things that we have here in London, such as intelligence in policing process, uh, can be utilised for exchange purposes where we have British police officers from the London Metropolitan Police going over to Jamaica, uh, vice versa, an exchange with Jamaicans coming here, so that they can contribute to an understanding of the movement of people who are involved in criminal activity. That's one example. But I think there are lots of other areas that we can build cultural, uh, social, economic bonds that would help the economies of the Caribbean, not just Jamaica, this is a focus on Jamaica, but I think we've got to see the Caribbean as a region, an economic region, that eat, what each nation looks after itself, uh, that there are issues that affect all the countries in the Caribbean, uh, including those which are still dependents, which I think Britain as a whole needs to be influenced to give greater support, greater recognition to how some of those problems can be tackled. And th so I think the friendship agreement puts an onus on the bigger partner in this, the better resource partner, the Greater London Authority, to use its energies to help those Jamaicans here who are experiencing unequal treatment. That was the British peer, Lord Wesley, talking about an agreement that was signed between Britain and Jamaica at much better times. And in those two last extracts, uh, there is a certain irony which mirrors the time reflecting the movement of change, the long cruel road from enslavement to emancipation, the downhill drop to societal rejection, and the steep upward slope to perish. A hint at redefining the whole concept of what it is to be British. Let's look back, breaking out. If we reflect on the period when England was a small part of the Roman Empire, we'll find that peoples of African descent played no small role in the shaping of what will later become the nucleus of the British Empire. Today, blacks from the continent and the Caribbean, in like manner, have contributed to the social and economic transformation of Britain. Their influence has recently been captured in the previously exclusive architectural landscape the physical shape of London. Both my parents are Barbadian, my dad's an architect still practicing in Barbados now. My mum still lives in London, she's been here over 40 years. Um, she's a retired nurse and currently takes great pleasure in looking after my son, her nine-year-old grandson. Um, I spent some of my time living in Barbados in my childhood, about seven years, but most of my life has in fact been spent living in London, in the south, in southeast London. Growing up in the UK was interesting but challenging for this Bajan lass. It's been interesting because of my mixed experience and I think living in Barbados for seven years and then coming back to London aged about nine, nine and a half, nearly ten, it was to say the least, a culture shock. I returned to London in the late 1960s 
at a time when although yes people of West Indian origin people of Caribbean origin been living in Britain now for in numbers since the sort of late 50s sort of early 60s um, where I grew up in South London there still weren't that many of us so that that in itself was a challenge um, I arrived back with a fairly strong Barbadian accent from what I can understand so that made life equally interesting for my kind of classmates um, and teachers. Um, I was staggered, I recall, by the expectations of my school teachers, in fact, that my education should somehow be of a lesser standard because I'd just come back from this tiny island in the Caribbean and I remember having to redo a lot of work that I'd already done at St Matthias um, Girls' School in Christchurch um, and being amazed about things that you actually did in school in London, you know, it seemed to be a bit more play and less kind of concentration on work, I think. I think I even commented to my mum on that, but yes, it, it, it was difficult, um, but I think at that time as well, the Caribbean communities, the West Indian communities were very tightly, tightly knitted and so that actually helped to be a buffer. Really. Very early there were questions of identity which could have fostered some confusion and an ongoing struggle. England are at the moment having a crisis. For me personally, um, I've clung, clung on very forcefully to my Barbadian heritage and I suppose I've been able to do that because in fact most of my family are still in Barbados. My mum was the only sibling to leave. As I say my father's now back in Barbados and over the years you know I've done numerous trips, <laughs> um, spending long periods and um, which has meant lots of questions each time I come back or people saying oh we thought you were coming back for good this time but um, since I've had my son I've not been able to come quite so frequently but I think because I have, I'd say I've, it's been an important part of me, an important part of my survival in Britain because I believe that um, other communities do it as a matter of course regardless of whether they're white or Asian or whatever. But I think those of us that are here of West Indian origin kind of struggle with holding on to our identity. And um, we struggle with what, how we defined ourselves. And so, and I think it's an important thing for me to hold on to, to pass on to my son. My son's already very familiar with Barbados. So, although at the moment at nine, the things he likes are Shafet, snack box and macaroni pie in K Shepherd and sea baths but he knows about Barbados and he enjoys his trips at two times he's been there he really enjoys it. Mrs Haynes had an interest in teaching and also worked at the Greater London Council abolished in 1986. She now has a focus on development policy and tongue planning with respect to applications as they come in. Um, the area that I work in in East London, in sort of for Tower Hamlets Council, it's probably under some of the most intense um, development pressure anywhere in London at the moment. Um, 40, about 40% 40 of all commercial development, office development, is taking place within the Tower Hamlets kind of boundaries. Uh, the Mayor's kind of development plan for London is talking about it accommodating 40,000 homes up to 2016 accommodating development that could provide up to 150,000 jobs. It's within the sort of footprint of the 2012 Olympic bid, so there's a lot going on. Um, and so it means we really have to be kind of tooled up to kind of deal with all these pressures. And we're sort of, you know, we're, we're running. <laughs> we're running to try and keep up with what's coming at us, you know, every second. You know, there's transport infrastructure coming in to accommodate all these other things that are, are happening. And then sort of in that context, we also have to be very much aware of the sort of communities that are living in our location. And the plan that we are preparing at the moment has to really take account of that. Even in the unfriendly British environment, the evidence shows that once the individual knows his or her strengths and is given the opportunity, the outcome is beneficial for all. Our next set of extracts will be taken from the county, boasting the largest Bajan community, 
in England, Reading, going back four generations to the 60s. They take pride in their contribution to the work as workers and of helping to promote balance in education. We are still contributing to that task. Our, fa our, our forefathers started it and we're still continuing that. Um, but it's meant that it's become easier to, to get the jobs that you, you require. It's become easier to get into schools that you once could not. It's become easier to go and get interviews for jobs which once upon a time our parents would have wished for but could not because of the, when we first came here, because of the xenophobia, if you like, um, we couldn't get there. But now it's becoming that much clearer, that much easier. I think it's a, it's a, it's a great benefit. I think we're fortunate in Reading that we have a reasonable education in the town. As a result of that, you've got a number of Barbadians who now are able to apply for the professions, be it accountancy, law, computing, and indeed medicine. In fact, one of the interesting things about Reading is that you've got a number of very skilled people who have moved outside of Reading and reside in various places such as London and indeed overseas. And the fact that people are born here, they live here, their job aspirations are therefore much higher than their foreparents. And I think the important thing is it starts in the school system. In, in my day, very few people were at the grammar school for the boys and girls. Now, if you go to Reading or Kendrick, people of West Indian origin are much more commonplace than, say, in the early 50s or indeed the 60s. Just as it is in Barbados, in Reading, education is recognized as one of the keys to social mobility. But questions are being asked about the school system and the relevance of the curriculum to the ethnic minorities. It's not very rare to see lots, there's lots of um, children of Caribbean origin at school. Um, it's, it, I know that before it was quite rare, but nowadays it's just, there's nothing wrong with it now. Before people used to find something wrong with it, but now you can go into any school and you just find all races in the school. I think increasingly there's more recognition of the black contribution. It is still totally unsatisfactory. For, for example, I went to one school, one of the grammar school, and I asked what aspect of the curriculum would include West Indian culture. Unfortunately, the only indications were the odd, the odd book as part of the English syllabus. There isn't anything about our history or indeed our culture. As a result, Saturday School has been introduced to provide invaluable information about West Indian history and culture, which, as the brother said, is no part of the British school curriculum. Parents are encouraged to encourage, parents are encouraged to recognize their role in helping to fill the gap. One of the things that I found is a lot of the time some of the schools did, they would band you all together. If one child was quiet, they would try and say, that family is all quiet, rather than give them the chance, just like any of the other children in the school, to be able to perform. If you, if us as individuals or the second generation parents then are there for our children to be the voice to say, my child is just as good as any other, represent them in the schools and show them what we can do, for not only ourselves but for our children as well. So I feel that having <coughs> a more positive attitude as parents for our children that are brought up here is helping to make things a lot better in the schools, more or less saying that we have a voice and we are here to stay. Decades of residency still have not solved the issue of identity leading to a longing to leave mother and return to the natural home. My parents were born in Barbados, so Barbados is a part of me, but Reading is my home, England is my home, this is all I know, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm English. I was born here, I was brought up here, I'm English, but Barbados will always have a special place in my heart. And for some reason, I don't feel at home here. 
Um, Barbados, to me, is home because when my parents speak about home, they speak about Barbados. Therefore, I define Barbados as my home. Um, I enjoy all the things in England, but still, there's a part of me. My, most of my family are in Barbados. I have very few family here. Therefore, I think that that is a lot to do with it as well. What do you intend to do with that? What do I intend to do about it? Um, I think I still look, I still am looking to, when I get older, to go to Barbados. I feel that is the best place for any old black person. I, I, I'm not, um, don't think that it, England is really a place to stay when you get old. Unlike Denise, that's waiting till she gets old. <laughs> I would like to go back to Barbados as soon as possible, to be part of the community, to work with the people in Barbados, and to enjoy the rest of my life over there, because I've been in much too long. I've been here 30 odd years too long, so I need to go back now. Barbados and England are both my homes, really, because I enjoy both of them, although I was brought up here. I enjoy both, really, the sun and the sea, but sometimes it gets a bit cold here, so I think back to Barbados. I have worked in this year for this country for 30 years and has reached a stage where I am really ready to go home. I have begun to make preparation in that direction. Most of my friends are at home and I shall soon be there as well. I was born here in um, England. Um, but again, I have, um, there's always something that's pulling me back to Barbados. I'm not sure what it is. I think now it's because uh, my parents are now getting to the age where they're going to retire. Um, they've bought a house and um, they're going back now regularly. Um, and I just think maybe that's where, I, that's where I want to be eventually. Whether I go back and, and work, work there or whether I wait until I retire is something else. When I first saw Barbados in 79, um, it, was, it was an event which would, would shape the rest of my life. If my vision was a foot long in 79, it became 10 foot long after that. Because um, the experience of actually going to the land which you've heard so much about, and I've heard many stories about, to actually witness people who are actually of your same image and cast in a more positive role, not just on the beach and um, under the palm trees, etc. I think it's very enlightening and for all young people who were actually born over here, I find that once they have actually experienced the, the, their mother country, so to speak, I think it broadens one's view and it opens the world to you. And as far as Barbados is concerned, although I was born here in England, my first visit to Barbados felt to me as though I had been going home, not going to a place that I had never actually seen before because the acceptance and the warmth of the family, the people, the neighborhood. I just certainly did not feel different to anybody over there. And I would also hope that when my body begins to fail me, or even before then, that I could reside somewhere in our near the Green Hill in Barbados. If you appreciated those excerpts, we have two more for you. And they're taken from the people, the good people in Peckham. Community leaders in several counties saw education as a key to overcome some of their many problems, but within the school system, there were still many steep hurdles to be overcome. At one time, underachievement among the girls, and more recently, the lack of self-esteem among the boys. The girls have reportedly long overtaken the boys, who have thus become the underachievers. It is a worrying issue for black educators. We now hear that the British government has taken a step, a short step back in what is commonly referred to as Theresa May's hostile environment policy. If it accepts the report from Barbados-born QC Martin Ford, Winrush, as well as post-Winrush victims who were deemed to have been wrongly deported or detained will qualify for monetary compensation. According to Barbados Today, the report has been recommended to the Home Secretary, Sajid Javid. In the meantime, Mr. Ford has urged that all persons living in the UK who have not yet re regularized their status to stay should do so as a matter of urgency and prior to making any claims. 
Persons who, may, who were detained may be eligible for as much as 10,000 pounds for the first day. The overall package is expected to cost mother in excess of 200 million pounds. Mother is famous for preserving any and everything. Yet in October 2010, home, the Home Office under Theresa May took a decision to destroy the disembarkation cards dating back to the 50s and 60s, despite protests from staff that these papers were often the last remaining record of a person's arrival date. The crisis has, that has been created has been described by one Labour MP, David Lamy, as a direct result of systemic incompetence, callousness and cruelty within the British immigration system. Reporting on the matter in early 2018, The Guardian mentioned a Judy Griffith, 63, who flew to the UK from Barbados in 1963, age nine, and who was unable to return to visit her sixth mother in 2016 because of her disputed immigration status. The officials said they could find no record of Judy in the system. As a result, Judy was unable to visit with her sick mother before she died, nor could she attend the funeral. So far, the evidence has shown that mother extended unapologetic hostility to her children. That failed to disrupt the latter's focus or to blunt their determination. Moving from multicultural societies to one where, by its own standards, institutional racism pervades is like attempting to kiss the lips of a spewing volcano. That the Wingless generation has been able to withstand mother's reproach and yet leave its mark on the cultural, physical, and productive landscape of Britain is no mean achievement. We in the Caribbean must not be guilty of minimizing their courage, their perseverance, and their preservation of cultural and historical identity. They did not cower when facing sustained attempts at marginalization. They did not revert abuse or aggression when assaulted with racial slurs. Their civility remained unquestionable. They did not hold back when assigned tasks unbefitting their obvious qualifications and known skills. Neither denial of shelter none of constitutional rights led them to panic. They managed their sustained ordeal with dignity to the point of having honored an uncaring and cruel mother. Let us all give them sincere commendation, inclusive of the 43 that left that small village at Stuart Hill St. John between 1955 and 1966. We thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Claude. Don't go too far away, because we would like uh, to see if there are any questions uh, uh, in the audience. I, I found that a fascinating uh, presentation. I'm sure you all did as well. I learned many, a great many things. Uh, one of them was that Reading is a place where most Barbadians are. Uh, I actually went to Reading. I used to think that was Britain's most boring town. I lived in 134 St. Saviour's Road, Coley Park. The dinner ladies of Coley Park School were amazed at this little black boy who would go and do all the mass homework during the lunchtime because it was so easy compared to what we were learning in Barbados. Um, I was fascinated, too, about this sense of identity. It seems that this generation, now probably the third generation West Indians, um, have a slightly easier life than the Windrush generation did in terms of opportunities and racism. Still, we know from the data in terms of housing, accommodation, wages, they're still under uh, pressure. Um, but it seems that they are struggling to understand uh, to, or to get a sense of their identity. Are they West Indian? Are they British? Um, one of the things I learned, because from my own struggle, was I... Barbadian, West Indian, British, uh, is that you can, be, you can be all of those things. 
you needn't choose one over the other. Uh, the Americans seem to have a better sense of, uh, of that. If you meet a Greek American, they're very, very Greek and they're very, very American. Uh, and uh, maybe we need to try and think about alternative forms of identity rather than choosing one or the other. Um, and the final thing I, I learned in your, your presentation made me think a lot about is how do we re-engage with that community in, in Britain? They are part of us and also part of something else. Um, they seem to only want to think of us as a place to retire. But are there other ways of engaging with that community? I think that's one of the objectives of the gathering, where we're going to bring uh, the diaspora back to Barbados and hopefully end up with new relationships. People come back as visitors, as tourists, as investors, as collaborators, uh, and think of Barbados then uh, as greater Barbados, not just one island, but also all of the connections of people who live abroad and not just a place for retirement. So it's very hard for me to see you in the audience there, but do you have some questions for Claude? Have you, you your own reflections on his presentation, your own uh, history, your own thoughts? Good uh, evening. We yes. have a question from Rodney B, who's watching online. Right. Yeah. Regarding the documents of immigrant arrival, they wanted to know, so do the passenger shipping records not exist anymore? The information that we have acquired indicates that there was a deliberate policy to destroy those records, notwithstanding the fact that those working with the records advised the authorities that these were essential commodities. And they were regularly getting requests from persons uh, affected and who wanted to, uh, sus sus wanted to substantiate uh, their relationship. They wanted to confirm that they were, in fact, in Britain for so many years and that they were British citizens. But because of the deliberate policy to destroy, notwithstanding their history of preserving any and everything, they went ahead um, with quashing uh, those essential items. One may want to assume that it was a deliberate act. I'm not saying that, but that's a very real possibility. I'm ready to answer any other questions. When I went to school in England, I never felt acknowledged. I never felt accepted because of being racially mixed. It was a very difficult time. Um, the white kids would call me names, and the teachers were no different. It's, it left a very painful distasteful part in my core. Today I'm presently writing a book about it. But every time I come home to Barbados, I've never felt anything other than being Barbadian. So I think my migration, what that did for me was, the positive part about it was allowing me to hold on to being Bajan. Because when I would be in the corner crying and hurting at school, where kids were calling me gollywog and putting ink on me and spitting on me as a child, the fact that I could remember the beautiful ports about Barbados kept me going. Today what it has done it has motivated me to write a book. My sister became the first black matron of a hospital. And I speak to her at 86 years old. And that I think the strength of being a Barbadian was what kept her alive. When my t sister tell me about the feces and the urine that was thrown at her because they didn't want a black nurse to take care of them. Yet she was the woman when the train broke. She was the first nurse on the premises. England for me has left a distaste. I went back four years ago and there are three generations of my family. And for me, I don't think they have an identity. They don't know who they are. Am I black? Am I white? Am I British? Am I Bajan? I tell them all the time, you're Bajan. Thank you. And we thank you. Your contribution has certainly added to the vein of the discourse. And I appreciate the fact that you indicated 
that there were benefits for you from having traveled to Britain, notwithstanding the fact that the experience was a bad one, you were able to appreciate all the more what you left behind in Barbados. I have so many questions, <laughs> so many of my own answers. But from your lecture tonight, sir, my question stroke concern is this thought or this offer of compensation, my understanding of compensation, especially financial, monetary compensation, means that once you deliver that sum of money to the other, the problem is over. The law says this is closed now. And as far as I feel, having spent 32 years out of this island, best in the United Kingdom, I would like, see, I don't think a lecture, a discussion, is the same thing as a conversation. And I think that's the, what, the drum that David Lammy is consistently beating. We, have, we cannot cover this over by giving someone 10,000 paltry pounds, as far as I see it, for the amount of anguish to one morning be put in a holding pen. I left Britain on the 31st of October last year, having spent four months. I got to the airport, the checking in lady told me, oh dear, BA, British Airways, has oversold the seats and there's no seat for you. I said, you will find one, nicely, politely, because I have to get home, I've got coming back here. And so she said, she looked again, she talked to someone more senior and there was still no seat. So I thought, okay, this is an opportunity and I thought, well, if I have to wait, I have to wait. In my head, I didn't say it to her. I was sort of pushing that I needed a seat. Anyway, we started a conversation. And I said, were you here doing, this woman was of Caribbean descent. I think she said her parents were Guyanese. And she was born in Britain, so she said she was British. And I said, were you ever on duty when the wind rush fiasco broke loose and what did that feel like and instantly tears sprang to this woman's eyes she described one morning over 200 people were herded in like weak whimpering sick cattle to be put on planes to be distributed back towards the West Indies and I remember feeling like somebody had punched me in the solar plexus, weak and also very, very, very furious. And I said, well, what about your colleagues, your peer group? She said, interestingly, that morning, 80% were English, white English. And she said, they all wept openly at their desks that they were witnessing this type of inhumanity. Eld women in their 70s, 80s, then the next generation, then children holding on to their coattails saying, please, sobbing, weeping. And I, she, she remembered, and I don't know, I wasn't there, that it was at that time that Mr. Hewitt, Guy, Reverend Hewitt, who was here last night, David Lammy, and others had already been rebuked by Prime Minister Theresa May that they needed to have a conversation and she wasn't available. And she said, halt, because the media was about to depend, descend upon Gatwick Airport. No 10,000 pounds, no 1 million pounds, no multi-million pounds can heal that anguish, which I must remind us all, I must remind us all that we have to have the conversation and it won't be easy. In fact, I told Professor Chamberlain last week, lots will actually die because that anguish is in the belly. And the only way to serve with love, that's one of my favorite films. And Sidney Poitier showed the world what was possible. But you cannot heal 
unless you feel and you're hurt. Mm -hmm. So I have no idea what's going to happen after next week when the final lecture closes here. But I would like to propose to suggest, and I'm prepared and willing to do my minuscule part, that we think seriously about our role in this very privileged place in which we live, despite its imbalances, how are we going to help not just the ones who are going to come for a grand, fantastic time next year. Anybody could do that any time. But this is an opportunity I believe we should not, must not miss and allow the chapter to be shut down. And those landing cars were deliberately destroyed. They were held in Croydon, deliberately. And I was victim to that in 2016, but that's quite, I've sorted it out. So, you know, we've all got our wounds, and there's something about a wound with a scab going over it, and there's something about a wound being nurtured and cleansed and kept cleansed till it comes up and up till one can say this is healed, and it's not by any means going to heal without due effort. That's my personal opinion. Madam, I'm compelled to say that I would be totally lacking in grace if I didn't commend you for your comments and if I didn't indicate that I can't disagree with anything you have said. One final question, perhaps? Perhaps two. I wanted to ask, and it's not direct, directed to you, Mr. Graham. What is the museum of Barbados doing to recognize and honor the Win Rush generation more permanently? I'm told that Herbert House at Fontabelle, which now house the cricket legends of Barbados, that that was the location where people registered and perhaps got on the plane later than the, in the 60s, perhaps rather not in the 40, in 40s, I don't quite know. But that was the location where it was centered. It is now cricket legends. And to my mind, there ought to be some space made there, if that is the exact location, where there should be some memory to the Windrush generation. Um, I recall several times speaking, um, state, government, central bank, speaking to the remittances that came to shore up the economy of Barbados by the Windrush generation. Such records can be made available from the history of the central bank and so on. Everybody has photographs. There is something somewhere that we can contribute to create in some sort of museum to honor and remember those um, pioneers beyond the lecture here tonight. Just putting it out there, we're in the museum space and perhaps museum directors and others can give it some consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. I can't presume to speak on behalf of the museum, but I would take the very important work that they are now engaged in currently to draw attention to the Windrush experience, uh, that would serve as a marker for the seriousness with which uh, they view this particular issue. And from looking at the materials that they have amassed and the focus that they have indicated they are taking, uh, one could see that their current effort uh, is not going to be short-lived, but I can see without being presumptuous, that it is something that would be sustained. Final question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Graham. I would like to, not a question, because there's hardly a question I can ask based on your presentation. But I would like to comment uh, my sister here and the uh, woman that spoke of her experience in England. I remember when I left Barbados in 1963, 
My son was two months old. And I left him. And within one year, I sent for his mother. And I promised my mom that if I wasn't, if I did not achieve this five year dream, I would send for her for a holiday. And in 1966, I sent for my mother to London in, on holidays. So she would have been one of the first, if not the only woman or ordinary person that would have went to England in the 60s on vacation. And that was just after Barbados became independent. And what she taught me when she came, she saw what most of us did not see when we got there, because we were there working. She was on holiday. And by the time she got in 1966, I had two other children, one one year old and one six months old. And she was horrified that I was taking her grandchildren to nannies to be looked after. But these nannies were, you knock on the person's door, they open the door and you hand the child to them. When you finish work, you go, you knock on the door, and they hand you the child. You had no idea what goes on inside of the house. And she said to me, no, this is not the place for her grandchildren. And she said when she was returning to Barbados, she was going to take the two children back to Barbados with her. So she raised all three of my early children. And I did, me or my wife, had no role in bonding with those children. That bring me to the point that the sister have said. There has to be a conversation of the experience like the sister who spoke about the pain that she still feels. And until we have that conversation, we cannot get rid of it. I close with this. In 1978, I organized a family reunion. That was the first international family reunion in Barbados. Barbados is now renowned for family reunions. I also, in 1992, organized the Society for the Resettlement of Caribbean People, or Caribbean Nationals. So what is happening now is a great opportunity, not for Barbadians to just come and visit, but for we to have that conversation. And I applaud the museum for recording some of our experiences. And my experience that I'm just sharing with you is on the museum website as a contributing factor to this whole program. I left you with one thing, Mr. Green. The 1959 Mental Health Act, which came into place Following the 1958 race riots in Notting Hill and Nottingham was the most devastated bit of legislation in the so-called hostile environment. And I would like yourself and others to pay attention to the number of people who have been put in the mental institution and classified as mentally ill 
when there was nothing wrong with them just to send them back to the Caribbean. Hence, it was said that all people coming back from Britain was mentally ill. Not from Canada, not from America, but from England. It all to do with the 1959 Mental Health Act. Thank you very much. We thank you for sharing your experiences with us and for assisting the process initiated by the museum to document those experiences. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kay Hall. I am the museum's education and community outreach officer. Um, I just wanted to just um, thank the lady for her comments about the documenting of the Windrush experience. And just to let everyone know that our documenting efforts do not stop here. Um, we are, in fact, um, currently working on an exhibition called The Enigma of Arrival, um, the Politics and Poetics of Caribbean Migration to Britain, which should be launched in time for Windrush Day this year to mark the anniversary. Um, so everyone will be able to come to the museum and see that, and thereafter it will be traveling around the Caribbean and certain parts of Europe as well. And in addition to that, we are also a part of a project which is being done between several countries to establish a virtual museum of migration and memory, which is going to document these experiences in an online museum where people from all over the world can access and be a part of understanding that Windrush experience. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Kay. Uh, and I think that whilst what we've learned today from some of these questions, we must celebrate and commemorate the Windrush generation, those who left from here. But we also need, uh, as the sister mentioned, to be part of the fight for their rights in Britain, uh, because they are being denied rights as British citizens, as people who've lived in Britain and contributed to Britain for all of these decades and have justifiable, legitimate, moral, and other rights that are being uh, trampled over. The title of this, this theme is from Invitation to Deportation. And we've not discussed it head on too much because of the, I think we all agree where we are. This is what Britain is doing is morally reprehensible, is great, disgraceful. It is not just the sum of the individual pain though, and we've heard about some of the individual pain. It is a, a community pain. It's a pain, like most pains, that extends not just to the West Indians, but to the British too. Because what we are seeing today in Brexit Britain is a logical extension of this inhospitable position that they are taking towards immigration, towards, uh, towards West Indians. And this, you could see the mess that this has put them into. And so we need to have a conversation. And this conversation, though, is a mutual conversation. It's about our sense of identity. It's about their sense of identity too. And there is a healing that needs to take place on both sides. Thank you very much for being here tonight. And thanks. please thank again uh, Claude Graham for a wonderful presentation. Good night.